Good evening, everyone. Uh, to do a brief intro, my name is Courtney Chung. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm a second year full-time MBA student at Anderson graduating in the class of 2022. And over the past six months, I've had the honor of serving as the VP of Programming on the EDW Planning Committee, and it has been incredible to watch this entire week of events come to life. When I started my program at Anderson, I knew I wanted to develop skills that would broaden the impact I could make in my career, particularly through the lens of equity, diversity, and inclusion. And this was a huge reason why I chose to get involved on campus as part of the EDW Planning Committee and as one of the co-presidents of Out at Anderson. EDW and all of the EDI conversations are being pushed forward like clubs like Out at Anderson and SOMA are critical parts of Anderson's commitment to creating more diverse, inclusive, and equitable spaces for students at Anderson from all backgrounds. So I'm super, super grateful that you all are here tonight supporting the important work that is being done on this campus. Before we kick the event off, a few logistical and technical things. First, uh, connect with UCLA Anderson on social media, uh, on LinkedIn and Insta. We would love to see any of your posts throughout the week to engage, um, especially since we're all virtual this week. And second, we do have a raffle going on for some dope swag from some of our clubs, including out. So please follow at UCLA Anderson on Instagram and share about EDW with the hashtags leading across difference and or embracing diversity week and tag us so we can see your post. And now without further ado, I will pass it off to Professor Chris Tang, who will do some intros and kick off the event. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, welcome to the at UCLA Anderson Embracing Diversity Week. And tonight's event is co-hosted by SOMA and Out at Anderson. SOMA stands for Strategy and Operations Management Association at Out at Anderson. I don't need to explain. Uh, my name is Christopher Tang. I am a faculty member and the professor and senior associate dean of the International Initiatives uh, of Anderson. So tonight's event is truly special. Uh, when the student invited me to moderate these sessions, when I look at the title and I search uh, James Battle's uh, background, I said I would be honored to do this. So tonight's title is Out, Proud, and Totally Indigenous Data Scientist. So before we begin, let me say a few words about the word out and also what does it mean to be Native American? from what I learned on the web and also some personal observations. Let me begin with some US history and statistics that we should not ignore. Stonewall riots in New York, 1969. AIDS epidemic, 1981. Death of Matthew Shepard in Wyoming, 1998. Legalization of homosexuality in the United States, 2003, legalization of same-sex marriage, 2015. Now you think that that's to be the good news, but we have a long way to go. As of today, 27 out of 50 states do not have law to protect LGBT community members regarding housing and employment. So keep that in mind. Also, in 2019, 20% of the hate crimes were motivated by anti-LGBTQ bias. 40% of the LGBTQ youths are considered suicide, much higher than the heterosexual youths. And just yesterday, there were statistics which showed 30% of all the unhoused youths in the United States, they belong to the LGBT community because many of them, they rejected by the parents. Now, then in the business world, I Googled LGBTQ CEO, and I find only 1,800 hits. Now, based on Google search, this is pathetic. Then you look at the name of the CEOs at the top 500 fortune companies, Number one, of course, is Tim Cook of Apple. The second one, you'll be hard pressed. It is Jim Fitterling with Dow Chemical. And then of course, we have Pete Buttigieg, our current secretary of transportation. But then also notice that all three of these individuals, they're all white males. So that means that if you don't belong to the, that group, the chance is not so good, but we need to do better, all right? 
So then the question is that is the LGBTQ community need more role models or representation to feel more encouragement so that we can move forward. So what can be done? I don't know, but we can discuss it. Now, looking at uh, James Battle's uh, background in terms of uh, Native Americans. Now, the, please keep in mind the education gap and the income gap for Native Americans are severe. Let me give you some statistics. Native American students are 200% more likely to drop out of school. They are also 200% more to be expelled from the school than white students. In 2020, one out of three Native Americans are living in poverty. And also within the Native American uh, group, the me median income was $23,000 per year. So as you can imagine, this is a severe problem we need to think about. All right, so now let me introduce tonight's special guest, James Battles. James is an executive data scientist at IBM. He's helping IBM's clients realize more effective ways to analyze data and building their capacity in data science. James grew up in the Klamath tribes area in Southern Oregon. He came out at age 17. Then he went to Cornell University to study human ecology. At Cornell, he was very active in the student group in terms of Native American student group, uh, American Indian Science and Engineering Society and out in the world and LGBT student organizations, extremely active on campus. Then after he finished his study, then he worked and then eventually he joined IBM as an executive data scientist. In his role, he has led solutions designed for companies facing complex operational problems. He has worked across a number of sectors, including semiconductor, aerospace, chemical, consumer retail, media, healthcare, technology, and finance. James has enabled many people in the data and science field and is energized by what he sees as, as our collective responsibility to make the world a better place. Welcome, James. James, let me start with uh, the question. When I'm looking at your background, I was really fascinated in terms of your out, proud, and, uh, and also Native American, your background. Now, being a minority myself, I can not even imagine what's it like being a minority within the minority. So can you share with us about your journey? Please, over to you. Uh, certainly, and I have to use my phone as a microphone. My computer isn't working, so you'll see this every once in a while. Uh, hopefully that's not too distracting. But uh, I, grew, I grew up in a very rural area. Uh, to give you some context, there were approximately 30 people in my high school class. So the town itself had uh, less than 1,000 people in it. And uh, you know we were fairly uh, distant from any uh, population center. And as opposed to now, back in the 80s and early 90s, you know, there was not such a thing as the internet or social media, no way to connect with people or find community uh, as such. So it was an extraordinarily isolating uh, scenario, uh, situation. Um, but, uh, you know, when, when we when think about American Indians, uh, I'll add some context, uh, add one more data to your, your fact sheet there, which is very well researched, uh, Professor Tang. Uh, you know, a lot of people don't realize that American Indians were not even considered US citizens until 1924. Um, so, you know, it, it just by a quirk of the Constitution and discrimination and, and all the complex colonial history. So there, there, there was a, uh, a lot of tension in, in the community between American Indians and the tribes and, and, and the white community. And within the American Indian community, you know, I, I was kind of in a no man's land, uh, so to speak, uh, because I wasn't I'm, uh, my father is full native. My mother is white. So I wasn't really accepted by uh, my peers and on the American Indian side. On the other hand, the folks that were Caucasian didn't accept me as fully white either. So I was kind of a, you know, an island within an island within an island, if you will. Um, and uh, while that could seem dispiriting, uh, I, I guess I made a decision early on that I wasn't going to let let that get me down. So 
um, I, I started, I, I guess I made an early decision to prove myself. And, uh, you know, if I wasn't going to be accepted, I was going to make my own space. And um, that, uh, as time went on, uh, you know, uh, in terms of coming out of the closet, to, uh, you know, I, first to my friends and family, uh, there was a lot of negative reaction, a lot of concern, a lot of uh, a lot of my extended family are Christian, of course. So there was a lot of fear over what that could mean. And it was really my Native American grandmother who settled the debate when she was told, uh, you know, people went to her as the matriarch of the family and said, what do you think? Uh, Jimmy is gay. You know, what do we do? And she said she just laughed and she just says everyone needs to calm down. She's like. Uh, Chief Lale to sign the Treaty of the Klamath with the U.S. government back in the 1865. Uh, she said Chief Lale was gay. Nobody cared about any of this stuff until the Christians came. And, uh, you know, and then that uh, she started uh, and uh, other elders of the tribe started sharing stories about the role gay people had, uh, both men and women and people who we would now consider trans in the context of the tribes. A lot of them were uh, you know, thought to have, uh, you know, both male and female spirits. And because of that, there was acceptance. Uh, for an example, uh, stories came out around, uh, you know, we all know the slogan now, take the village to raise a child. Well, you know, if you think about tribal societies, there might be hunting parties that go out and a lot of the men would go off on the hunting party. Well, who takes care of the children? A lot of times it would be either the gay men or the trans people who maybe we're not as strong that would stay behind and take care of the children and make sure everything was safe. Uh, so there was always something for somebody to do. And uh, in context of spirituality, the folks who we would now call trans were considered a lot of times to be the, you know, they must have been, you know, having two spirits, two strong male and female spirits inside of them. And, um, you know, we're oftentimes tapped as the medicine men or the spirit or medicine people or the spiritual leaders in some context because they thought, you know, so there was a whole different cultural context back in the 1800s that uh, got uh, uh, demolished by the Indian boarding school movements and, uh, you know, the different uh, hardcore Christian, you know, uh, uh, movements that came through the territory. So once that started being shared again, it, it kind of relaxed and reopened people's minds in, in, my, in our own community as to what that meant. And, um, and then a lot of other Native Americans started coming out of the closet. And it kind of set off a little chain reaction. And now it's maybe still be joked about here and there, but it's not considered a big deal anymore. When people come out, there's openly, you know, gay people living together, um, finding each other. And, and, and it was, it, it was uh, you know, over the last 20 years, 30 years, it's been really exciting to see, you know, that transformation happening. And not just my tribe, but, um, you know, many of the other tribal communities in the Northwest as, this, as the gay rights movement has taken off. It's, you know, helped reopen people, some people's minds as to what that means. Wow, this is a wonderful story for you to share with us. So I'm so glad that your community was uh, so open-minded and also accepting, starting with your grandmother. Now, your oh, story- I, I, wouldn't say, I, I wouldn't say they all are. There's still a fair yes, degree of Yes, of course. Uh, but, but I think progress. that is a big uh, uh, movement and progress. And your story reminds me of uh, a quote uh, from the former mayor of San Francisco. He was assassinated. Have a milk. He said one time, he said, if everyone comes out, then in case it will settle all the scores in the world. So I hope that one day uh, no one need to come out. It's just the way it is. So I hope that uh, that would, not, would be the day will come soon. Thank you so much. Now, then after you went to school to Cornell, then you're going to from a small village to Ithaca. It's still small, but then later on, you're going to New York. Then, in the case, is a bigger transition. Can you share with us about your journey from a, a smaller place to a bigger place, a corporate world? Uh, were there any uh, pushback, any challenges that you faced, and you had how do you overcome that? I, I think the biggest challenge in moving to a bigger place, you come from a small town area, you you know everybody, uh, or, or or at least one or two degrees of separation. And the biggest shock was realizing that there's more people than you can possibly know. If you move up into a university with thirty thousand students, it's a much bigger context. So it's a little bit of a, a little bit of a your brain can short circuit a little bit absorbing that many different people. But I also I, I think mostly I found it extraordinarily invigorating. 
you know, I, I like input, you know, as a data scientist, I like input. And uh, back then, uh, you know, 18 years old, 19, it was a whole new world opening up, you know, people from all different countries and different backgrounds and just being exposed to things I'd never heard of. Um, and, uh, you know, and so made a lot of good friends in the process. Uh, but uh, while at Cornell discovered that um, there was a fairly active American Indian uh, Native American student organization that I was glad to be part of. And even that, just knowing a lot more about the New York tribes, the Iroquois nations and so on, I'd never didn't know anything about them. So it was a really good cultural exchange of well, how do you make your food and how do you, what kind of songs do you sing? And, you know, and what are your stories? And, and, you know, I'd grown up with mine, but I'd never heard of this and vice versa. So um, just within the native community itself, it was just a, you know, just a, a really exciting, you know, shift. Um, I'd say like uh, I, I graduated Cornell with very high hopes and expectations of what this would mean as you move on into the world. Uh, but, um, you know, entering the corporate world back in the you know late nineties and early two thousands, it was a, you know, not the same as it is today. It was still, uh, if there, uh, there, uh, I, 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 there were certainly a lot more open expressions of sexism, racism, homophobia, um, than than things that people would get fired over in an instant today were, you know, commonplace. You know, back then, as you probably maybe have experienced your or witnessed yourself, and uh, that was a bit of a, a shock. Like, how open can I be in the corporate workplace, and do I have to, you know, how do I? Uh, um, you know, be myself without, you know, and, and I, it was yeah, having to cover up, you know, maybe I don't talk about being gay because I don't know what that means to this investment banker or that, that and, you know, and so on. Um, so uh, it was a, it was a struggle, but as time went on, I just, uh, you know, I, I let my work speak for myself, I suppose. And, and, and then when I put forward good analysis or when we would make a lot of money on something, and then I would gradually disclose more and more and say, see, I'm, still the same person but um you know it was and uh you know my, when, when i compare notes with other people and uh, with with their backgrounds being who if they're minority or or women and, and hearing some of their the stories of things that they've gone through there's still some that we still got a lot of work to do you know there there's still there's still discrimination that's happening um you know in and in, 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 in companies we work with or even even my firm i hate to say i i've, I've witnessed some things um, but, uh, you know, it, it, it's, it's been, uh, it, you know, I, I'm, it, 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 I guess it requires, a, as they say in democracy, eternal vigilance. You know, you have to keep, you know, ma making it as safe a space as you can for people that are following. Um, you know, uh, when I, when I first, for example, met, uh, Chris Lowe on your team, uh, in, in your, in your cohort here in the, in this group, um, it seemed like to me that the comp that people were kind of pigeonholing him into a certain role. And, uh, you know, when I talked to another uh, uh, IBMer who was uh, uh, a former Marine Corps, uh, I can't remember his exact title, but was a command, he was commanding a tank legion, basically, in the Marine Corps. And he said, you got to work with this guy, Chris. He, you know, they keep putting him on these, you know, back office projects, and he's really smart. And so he introduced me to Chris, and we brought him in, and our first project at Pratt & Whitney, they, they gave us a simple challenge. They said, you've got 12 weeks to figure out what makes commercial jet engines blow up in the air. <laughs> so Chris had never, uh, we had never uh, tried to solve that kind of problem before, uh, but Chris and, and we put together a, a kind of a mini SWAT team, a data science team, and we got to work. Um, and in 12 weeks, we turned it around and uh, we were able to make predictions on what causes jet, mal jet, jet engine malfunctions. And, uh, you know, and, 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 and Chris was kind of a, a really good uh, learning point for me because I was still I was relatively new to IBM and I was still trying to figure out how do I make the right team for a project and 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 I got a, a lot of learning out of that how to build diverse teams and how to you know uh, lead with the mission I suppose and and uh, you know and then uh, uh, attract the right talent and uh, build the right teams. Um, uh, some of the challenges that we have faced over the last ten years have what I call homogenous teams of, of people, of data scientists or engineers that are maybe all white men or all, you know, all the women get put on just HR projects or something like that. And I said, this is not right. We have to think about the problem and who has the right skills and specialty knowledge and expertise to bring uh, to bear on these problems. And so that's been my mission is how to, how to craft the right team that reflects our clients, reflects our customers. Um, because that's the solution that we're trying to design for in artificial intelligence and reduce the uh, bias that could infect those programs. Well, thank you so much. I think that this is really wonderful in terms of the uh, how you make the transition. Now, let, let me just make a transition to IBM. 
I'm also an IBMer. Uh, you may not know that well, before your time. I started in, uh, with IBM 1982 when they introduced the, the first PC, all right? Then things were not going well at IBM. In 1990, uh, IBM was close to bankrupt. I, I don't know, uh, I'll soon know that. Then they, they have to pivot to hire a new CEO. At that time, the new CEO was Lou Gerstner and everyone was shocked. He was from Nabisco. We call him Cookie Man. He doesn't know anything about computer, right? Then, he said that, then when we, he went to the office, I was working at IBM uh, TJ Watson Research Center. So he, he in his office, he does not even check email. He said, I, I, I don't do email. I just, uh, I don't know how to use a computer. Then everyone said, well, what is he going to do, right? But what is so interesting is that is he bring in a different perspective, top of diverse opinions, ideas. He was asking questions. Why do we do this? Why do we make computers? That was a question. Before, a lot of students may not know what IBM stands for. It means international business machine. Now, if a company does not make the machine, then what does it do? But it's a branding. It really transitioned from a manufacturing companies to a service company. So that's where the data analytics come into play. Now, he actually saved IBM to pivot from, a, so from the manufacturing space to a hybrid solution uh, to the customers, right? Now, I've seen the IBM also transform from a, the big blue formats. At the time, if you work for IBM, if you meet a client, pretty much you must be white, male, blue suit, white shirt. Those are the rules. If you don't fit in the profile, forget it, right? But we're seeing the changes. So now, uh, James, you're the younger generation. Can you share with us how do you observe IBM has changed over the years since you joined? I, I, I've been with the IBM family for about 10 years now. And I've, even in that brief time, for me, brief time period, it's, it's been a big shift in seeing the kinds of executives that are being groomed and for, uh, for promotion. M many more women. Uh, I, I have, in fact, more women in my reporting chain up, up to the CEO level than I do men. Um, uh, there's a, uh, Leadership councils are... You know, it, 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 I, I, I hesitate to use the word colorblind, but it really feels that way because there's, there's people from all different uh, countries and cultures that are represented on these things. And everyone, um, that at least that I'm working with, uh, takes the diverse, diversity, uh, equity and inclusion, you know, message very, very, very strongly. Uh, everyone seems to have uh, relatively diverse teams at this point, um, you know, so that and to me that if I were looking at IBM as a place to come work, I would look at that as a very as a as a, as a very welcome sign, you know, like if if you're interviewing with people who maybe look just like the students on this call, maybe a little bit more tenure, but everyone on this call, and you're and you're interviewing with a, a lot of different folks and 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 different backgrounds, um, I would say that's very encouraging. You know, when I first when I my first job in banking when I went well, long before IBM, you know, I was interviewed like you said just by white men only, and 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 this was before video conferencing, and some of those were on telephone calls only, and I think. You know, uh, to be fair, I think that my name may, may have fooled them because they see James Bettle if you don't think American Indian. And, and I got to wonder that probably some of those interviews I got were because they didn't realize I was American Indian. But if they had, I may, may not have gotten the interview. But I think a lot of those barriers are dissolving away, um, you know, but it's something that we all have to keep pushing for and making sure that we have equity and in, in, in diversity on, in all of our teams and we promote people fairly based on the merits of their work. Um, and uh, the more we do that, the more uh, you know, and, and people sense if it's a fair organization, they'll 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 work harder and they'll earn that promotion. If if they sense it's not fair, they will quit. So, well, this is a very uh, encouraging, James. I think that uh, IBM has transformed itself. Now, I want to ask you, from your perspective, you think that this movement, the DEI movement, you think to what extent is uh, top down from the executive level down, or is it the bottom up? So in that case, was it any form of intervention to trigger this movement or some kind of nudging? I, I think that uh, it's probably a combination of both. I think that the business leadership realizes that that this mission is good business. You know, it's very expensive to have high attrition and high turnover. You've got to then go out and try and find replacement people and train them and, and you lose time and, and resources doing that. So 
you know, keeping your employees happy is good business. It's also good business in another way because the more your company reflects the people you're serving, the better we can meet their needs. You know, as we are transforming at IBM into an AI company and, 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 and in the cloud, we have to be able to build uh, microservices and, and functions that meet the needs of people that they are designed to support. I'll give you an example. One of the, one of the biggest uh, opportunities right now is speech to text and, and, you know, having basically AI be able to understand what people are saying and translate that uh, into text and, 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 and uh, say you're going through a drive through and giving your order. Well, if you only train your AI on native English speakers, then what happens when somebody from where English is the second language comes through that drive through and tries to place the order, the AI will not recognize what they're ordering and they will have a negative customer experience, right? So as data scientists, we have to make sure that when we're training our AI, we reflect the diversity of our people. And uh, sometimes the best engineers to do that are people that come from those communities because they can, they can understand cultural nuances, the idioms, the ways that people order, you know, the kind of language constructs to look out for, you know, uh, you know, vernacular that may be local to a certain culture or community or even geographic area. So these are all the things that we as humans have to do if we want our AI to be the best in class. Well, thank you. Well, now let me also switch the topic to uh, about your heritage. Uh, your heritage is mixed, as you mentioned earlier. Uh, one of your parents is a Native American. The other one is a white person. Then the question is, you look at our student body, even tonight, uh, we have all colors like the rainbows. I love it. But then the question is from your perspective, when you start working, how do you uh, identify yourself in terms of, do you feel that is, uh, uh, do you play up certain elements of your heritage or you cover up certain part of your heritage? To what extent would that motivate you to identify yourself? Uh, so let me see if I understand a little bit of a complex question there. So are you saying out of work, how do I identify myself? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I'd say it's pretty much the same as I do at work. You know, I don't have two personas. It's, you know, if, uh, you know, if, I, if we're, uh, um, you know, if, if I'm at home and I'm visiting with family, we'll talk about, you know, um, you know, one, one thing that's, of course, I don't, I don't know how true it is for other people, but, you know, in the native culture, a lot of the conversation is, like who's related to who and the game of, oh yeah, okay, we're a cousin somehow. And it's, it could take an hour to figure out through the lineage who relates to who and whatever community we're going into. Um, but, uh, you know, if we're going to powwows and things like that, they don't really care about data science. We're talking about, okay, where did you, you know, oh, so-and-so is going out root digging or, you know, the huckleberries are about ready, who wants to go, you know? So we're talking about things like that. Um, or we're talking about who made what dress for which powwow and who's doing fancy dancing or who's doing traditional, you know, or how is, your grandma doing and there's a lot of talk about things like that so it's not really a, it, it's, it's not really an abrupt transition they might ask what are you doing and ibm data science would say oh it sounds like computers you know and that's you know that's as much as they want to know um okay. but uh, Good. Yeah. so that is a yeah after work now but then at work at ibm your yeah. inter intersectionality in terms of uh, uh, being a gay person and also being native american at least half uh, then the question is, how do you identify yourself at work? Uh, to what extent yeah. you feel welcome and included? Uh, I, I, well, I mean, it, it, I, I, I guess it's a hard question because if I leave with my ethnic identity, people might be thinking I'm waving a race card, you know, or, or a diversity card of some kind. So I'm a little careful to avoid that. But um, what w w more often it comes up in just casual conversation, if we're getting to know a client, maybe we're going out for lunch or dinner and they'll ask, oh, so James, are you married? I'm like, yes, I'm married. It's like, well, oh, how long have you and your wife been? Actually, it's my husband. We've been married for, you know, and 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 then the, the kind of, but I just treat it very, just very net neutral, very casual. And if they want to pursue further, we'll talk. If they don't, then we won't, you know, uh, but usually the next question is like, oh, well, you and your husband planning on having any children, <laughs> you know? So that's it's it, it they they even if there's a little bit of a shock you know or or people might mistake me a lot of times for being part Asian, uh, which is natural because I'm also Alaska Native, um, you know, features, uh, and, and uh, uh, so so I'll, I'll correct them there. It's actually an American Indian. It's like oh you don't look American Indian, and then they catch themselves like I didn't mean to, to sound funny, and I'm like well. A lot of people have the misconception about this, you know, headdresses and you know, riding horses on the planes and things like that. Um, you know, so it, it's uh, but 
mostly people seem to be delighted to, to you know, uh, to, to, to learn something new like that, you know, because there's not many of us. We're probably, what, 1% of the population as, as Native Americans. So that's not, most people are, you know, can be forgiven because they just never really had that experience before. That's wonderful. Thank you. So now, now I'm talking about leadership uh, because the student also like to learn from you in terms of as a uh, leader and a uh, executive manager at IBM. Uh, how has been your, uh, your, your uh, being a gay person and also is a Native American uh, shape your leadership, shape the way you interact with people? I think that, you know, going back to some of the earlier barriers that you highlighted in the opening, um, it's given me an appreciation for the, you know, people that I, that people of all backgrounds have usually have struggled in one way or another. And, you know, having some empathy for their experience and how they got to this point. And my, my, uh, in, in terms of American Indian, um, you know, my, my Klamath heritage, my Umatilla heritage, Alaska native, we don't do anything unless we're doing it together. And that's an ethos I try to bring forward in all my projects and my teams is I need everyone to feel welcome. I need everyone to feel part of the solution. Even if it's a little part, you know, they say in acting and there's no small parts and everyone has a role to play. And I, 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 you know, and, and so sometimes I may be going what on paper might be a little bit slower, but it's for a purpose. It's to make sure that everyone feels included. We don't leave anyone behind. And that's a style that I think is perhaps somewhat different from some of the other managers and executives I've worked with, where it's just, we got, just got to go and you're either, you're, you're either on the train or you're off, you know, and people tend to fall behind and get lost and confused in that kind of style, at least in my view. So I, I think that how I lead and how I bring teams together is really indicative of how my tribe operates. You know, it's, we have to do it together, you know, kind of guided consensus, if you will, lead from behind, you know, keep everyone moving in the same direction, you know, make sure they have the right tools and equipment to get the job done. Um, and just being mindful that everyone's different and, but with the right encouragement, they can all be part of that solution. And then as we turn that cycle over and over, I just see people getting more confident and then they start leading themselves. And then next thing you know, we're launching a thousand ships and it's just taken off. So for me, that's fun. Wow, this is a really uh, refreshing. Uh, you really describe the inclusive leadership and also that to develop your team members such that he or she or they can actually can flourish as well. This is wonderful. Now, so I want to ask you, this is always uh, in our students' mind. If you are, uh, belong to LGBT community or you are uh, not uh, non-white and also how, how should they uh, go about uh, applying for jobs? Should they disclose this at, right at the beginning? Should they in or out? What is your advice? I would absolutely disclose it if you feel comfortable. Again, it's not about, it's your comfort level, but I, I, I kind of like we have a saying now, it's like, bring your authentic self. You know, well, IBM is, I, I'd say at this point um, in, in, the, in, in our company's history, it's, uh, it's more intriguing to have, diver you know, people are, are looking for that diversity because they realize the best solutions come from having the most diverse talent we can bring together um, and, and work together. So I would absolutely disclose, if you feel comfortable disclosing, it's not, no one's gonna say yes or no as the candidacy and all that. You know, but but lead, you know, lead with your authentic self and describe what attributes you bring to, you know, uh, the organization. Now, for example, if you're, if you're active in a LGBT group and say I was part of this and I organized and as part of the organ or as part of the student uh, volunteer committee, uh, whatever it might be, you know, we had to organize X, Y, and Z. Well, an HR person or hiring manager might see this person looks like they're uh, getting project management skills, you know, kind of on the on the street, if you will. You know, they're, they're learning how to organize and, and plan logistics and things like that. So people are looking for evidence of, uh, you know, uh, how, you know, I guess I'd say everything at IBM is, is team oriented. So if you're part of any of these student organizations, uh, that's evidence of uh, team, you know, uh, uh, you know being a, a team player. Um, and, and, and certainly everything in AI now is so complex that no one person can do it all. It's a team sport. And well, the, the more the, the more experience you have working with people from diverse backgrounds is a benefit. Uh, IBM, International Business Machines, we are 
an international company. We've got probably more than half of our employees are over, are overseas. So having people who can understand how to correctly bridge cultural gaps and, and language. And uh, just the other day, I've been working with a couple of our research scientists in China. And so I have to, and, they're, and, and, uh, and they're, their English is limited, but it's far better than my Chinese, which is <laughs> zero. Well, so. well, uh, well, thank you. I think it's, it's really wonderful. Now, I have been uh, moderating different sessions about LGBTQ in terms of race issues, gender issues and all this, but there's one question uh, did come up uh, quite often. Uh, when you're in the minority, then the question is there's also fear. If I disclose myself, if I were a, a, a hire, were appointed, how do I overcome the fear that people will think that I was hired because I'm not white, I'm this, I'm that? How, what, what kind of advice will you provide? That is probably still a reality, I hate to say. For some people, I, I think that's that's the challenge I have as, you know, at my level in the company is to challenge other people at my level and above that when you're hiring for diversity, equity, and inclusion, it is not a check the box exercise. It's you're, you're, you're looking to bring in diverse talent for a reason. And here are the benefits of that. And a lot of them will listen to me because they've seen what I can do. And I say, but can you, he said, how would you have sold that deal or done that if I hadn't been there? What would, what would your options have been? So if I'm one data point, what if you had four more people like this, like this, you know, as part of the organization, what would that look like? Um, but I, I, I'd say that that's also an opportunity for you to get in there and show them what you can do. Don't allow yourself to be a check the box hire, even if that's what gets you in the door. Ultimately, what defines your success is how well you contribute and what successes you are able to bring forward. So maybe that might be something that happens, unfortunate, but maybe gets you in the door. Then you build a killer app or build a solve a problem that no one solved before then it's a whole new ball game now you start you people start giving you the talking stick and now you get to start deciding you know <laughs> you know now you get to be a, an agent of change and not just uh not just uh someone that's you know trying to grab on for the ride but but i but i will say for a lot of the people of uh, minority backgrounds that i've worked with and they, they it can be intimidating you know but you know all i can say is hang in there there's there's more of us out there than you realize and we're here to help you look for people like myself, look for allies and, and, you know, build your network, uh, you know, with people like myself and, 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 and uh, other compatriots like myself, because we're here to help make sure that you are successful and that you are treated properly and you have the right opportunities to grow. We're out. Well, thank you very much for your advice. So that means as soon as it's to feel comfortable to be their true self, uh, doesn't matter your high based on merits or DEI doesn't matter. Get in the door first. Once you're in the door, prove yourself. Make sure that you should lead by example, right? So I think that is James' uh, uh, fantastic advice. Thank you very much. Now, I know that the student gave me 35 minutes and my 35 minutes is up. So I want to take this opportunity to thank you and open up for the discussion. And then just, uh, Justin is going to lead the discussion. And I, I, at this moment, I want to thank uh, everyone for the privilege of your time. Thank you. I'm turning it over to, uh, to Justin. Thank you, James. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Kang, and of course, thank you to James for being here tonight. Um, so if anybody has any questions that they'd like to ask, we ask that you use the raise hand function to ask. Um, so please feel free to go ahead, um, but perhaps maybe to start things off, I'm going to take advantage of my own executive pri privileges here to ask James you a question. Um, as someone who is also a Cornell, who is also a Cornellian and coincidentally also a human ecology major, I'd love to hear a little bit more about what your experiences were like uh, making that huge transition from obviously a rural hometown to like starting this huge new experience at Cornell and how that has really shaped um, your life experiences beyond that. Well, I think that, you know, for those of you that don't know the College of Human Ecology at Cornell, Cornell's comprised of seven different colleges. Um, and I, I chose human ecology because it was, to, to me at that point, it was the area of greatest mystery. You know, how do humans think? How do we develop? How do we operate? You know, and, um, you know, so the, the coursework I took there was designed to kind of help me understand how to better relate to a bigger world that I had really no knowledge of. And I think it, it gave me a lot of perspective on, you know, the commonalities we share as human beings, but also how to recognize and handle differences. And 
those are some, uh, because as someone who was often treated as different or the other, or as uh, a non-human or as someone not deserving of the same rights as other people, you know, it, it gave me perspective for what my experiences were in common to other people who had those same struggles throughout civil rights history. And, um, and, 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 and the, the other coursework I took, you know, of course, moving in, into Cornell was to, you know, how do I turn that into, you know, tangible, you know, work skills, you know, what do I do with this? I can't just be a, you know, a flame throwing activist for the rest of my life. I have to actually, you know, pay the bills and, and, and paycheck and those kinds of things. So um, organizational principles, you know, um, how do organizations work, industrial and labor relations, you know, so you took some of those courses, you know, so um, I think it was all an attempt to figure out how to help me bridge that going from a town of a thousand people to, you know, a, a university of 30,000 and then, you know, you know, a, a company of several hundreds of thousands, you know, so I, I did, my learning is not over, you know, I, I there's every year I goes by, there's, there's a realization of how little I still know, you know, and, and how big the problems are still to, 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 to solve. That's wonderful to hear. Thank you for sharing some of your experiences. Um, I guess next up we have Kevin, uh, please feel free to go ahead. Thanks, Justin. And thank you, James, for being with, with us tonight. Um, one question that I had uh, was about um, your heritage being, you know, you've gone from a uh, small town to big town to even, uh, you know, a bigger city. And how have you stayed connected to your family? And has it, um, you know, has your career moving you away from your family led you to, um, I guess, miss out on some of those aspects that, you know, because family does seem very important and very close to you. And so um, how have you stayed connected um, as you've, you know, kind of moved around and uh, now, now working at, with IBM? That's a good question. I, I think that actually I'm probably closer to my family than I ever have been, thanks to technology. You know, we can FaceTime every day. Some of the hardest uh, times in my life were spending those four years at Cornell and being connected only by a phone call. And remember, no video, nothing like that back then, and only seeing your your family, uh, your parents, and and siblings in person a couple times a year. Um, now, of course, I FaceTime and can talk with my mom and you know Zoom calls and all that stuff uh, every day. Uh, other cousins as well. So I think technology has actually helped us stay in, you know, our own, you know, Facebook private groups, things like that. Um, I think technology is extraordinarily important for helping, you know, people like myself stay connected to what's important. You know, without that, I would probably just be drifting further and further away. Awesome. Thank you. And next up, we have Margot. Please feel free to go ahead. Hey, uh, thank you for being here tonight. Um, I was just curious to hear more about what led you to the like data science field and sort of what your, um, I guess your approach or if you have any sort of like philosophies around being a data scientist. Well, I think, you know, I, I, maybe my college experience makes it sound like I had it all figured out. I can tell you like in my head, I was probably, I uh, would consider myself a big hot mess of trying to reconcile all these changes that were happening and, 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 and so on. And, uh, but analytics and, and science really appealed to me because it was objective. It was, you know, governed by the laws of mathematics, physics, chemistry, immutable principles that, you know, were not subject to human bias or, you know, uh, you know, uh, think, things that were just driven by maybe human emotion and so on. So it allowed for me a, a, a clean mind space where I could really formalize and, and build out advanced thought frameworks and so on. And, and, and data science is really the search for truth, the search for meaning and patterns in, in vast seas of data. Uh, and, um, you know, and, and that gave me some sense of uh, calm, you know, it gave me a sense of purpose. It gave me a sense of what if I could, and then fill in the blank, you know, and uh, Chris has seen some of the work I've done, but, you know, it, it's in the work he's done as well. You know, it, it, for me, it's fun just being able to solve things that have never been solved before and bring that forward and then have, um, you know, and, and change the world for better, you know, and build models for forecasting what, what, what might uh, cause people to die sooner of diabetes and uh, for a, a, a dialysis provider. And when they presented at our conference, they had said, well, we've calculated that these analytical models have, are literally adding millions of patient years to our, 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 our patients' lives. And they're spending less time in hospitals, more time with their families, um, less time in critical care situations all with data science and that's just one project. And, you know, when I think if, if I could do that, it's just one person, 
what could a hundred people do if they had those, if they could be equipped with those same skills. And that's what really drives me to bring more people into this field because you, uh, you know, anyone who comes into this field really can be an agent of change, you know, and we can all connect with each other, regardless of our backgrounds uh, through the language of science. And that's, that's, that's what it feels to me. That's what brings us together. And we're going to need as many people as possible. If we're looking at the challenges of the future in terms of, climate deterioration and, you know, sustainability goals that companies are trying to implement, you know, we need more hands on deck, not less. Did I answer your question, Margo? Yeah, no, that was incredible. Thank you. I'm inspired. <laughs> Thank you so much for the question, Margo. Um, next up, Smita, please feel free to go ahead. Hi, I'm Smitha. Um, sorry for the mask. I am indoors right now. Um, I had a question kind of about um, the verbiage people sometimes use in business settings. For example, uh, many of them tend to be kind of um, native terms that are somehow appropriated for the business place, like find your tribe or lowest on the totem pole or off the res or like powwow in lieu of meetings. And I'm wondering how you've navigated those kinds of terms at work. And if you choose to speak up each time or you have learned to brush it off. I absolutely do not brush it off, <laughs> but I also find a way to engage with the person from a point of empathy and respect. Uh, for example, one of my uh, recent managers, you know, would, would, when I first came into the group would use teams or terms in our leadership meetings, like, oh yeah, we got to get together for a powwow to do this, or, you know, so-and-so is going off the reservation. And I would, uh, you know, and, and uh, uh, I would make time to meet with that person after, because I knew that they weren't, I could tell they weren't meeting it from a point of, uh, uh, to, be de to, to be demeaning anyone. It was just part of their reflexive vernacular, I guess I, I would call it that. And I, and I met with that individual uh, privately, and I just said, hey, look, I know you use those terms, and it, it, he didn't even remember using them in one of the scenarios, but I said, you know, off the reservation, you understand reservations in that context were meant as concentration camps to annihilate American Indian culture and peoples and prevent them from repopulating or, you know, they, they, they were essentially concentration camps. We, we would never make a joke about the Holocaust, for example, uh, in any context, and especially not if there were people of Jewish descent or Jewish people in, in, in the room. And I said, so that's how it is for me as an American Indian. When you say things like off the reservation, um, that the context was that Indian is leaving the reservation. We have to go get him and put him back on, you know, um, and keep him where he belongs. And, uh, um, and, you know, then, then what I noticed is like those terms just don't appear anymore, you know. Um, so uh, that that's how I choose to do it. Now, if, if I could I raise it in a bigger meeting, sure. The other thing that I do is I've made connections with other leaders in IBM who are whose mission is cultural sensitivity and cultural awareness, and and who are sponsoring the DEI. And so I mention these stories to them anonymously, but say here here's an example. And then I'm surprised the next year that that becomes part of the mandatory training curriculum that goes out to 400,000 employees. And so I have no, actually noticed that the use of those terms is diminishing in the last 10 years. Um, and be, and there's folks like me and maybe 30 others in IBM that are constantly help, helping push for this. But we are making change. It's a, it's a big ship, but little little shifts of the rudder can can steer that ship. Um, but it does take time. so much and next up i believe it's Anne. hi james thank you so much for the time today uh the question i have is about like mitigating bias in ai in ai specifically for like community issues are there any um things that you've been exploring or um, ideas that you have in this space and how can we as business students kind of address those issues i i think that is the the biggest unmet challenge in ai today is exactly what you described. And I think there's an increasing awareness that without ethical frameworks to surround AI, AI is poised to do a tremendous amount of damage. Um, before, you know, a few years ago when it was just classic data science, Wells Fargo, as an example, uh, they uh, built a model to, uh, as to what interest rates to charge people for their mortgages. And they used race and ethnicity as one of the factors in that model. Now, Historically, uh, let's say the African-American community has lower credit scores, but that's not because people who are African-American, it's because of a whole 
You can look at a whole litany of issues that lead to socioeconomic differences and structural differences and income gaps and so on for different ethnicities, racism, redlining, keeping African-Americans out of home ownership. You know, they haven't had the chance to build generational wealth the same way that uh, folks in the, in the white community have. And what that did was is it led to a weighting of a coefficient in that model whereby if you were African-American, you automatically got charged a higher interest rate or Hispanic versus white and even controlling for credit score and income levels and educational status and so on. It didn't matter. That one factor led to a, a, a differential rate bias in, in what interest rates people were charged. That led to a multitude of lawsuits and class action settlements that had to be addressed. And I think it was in the hundreds of millions that Wells Fargo had to pay. So that drove a whole rethinking about how do you use that. Uh, but there's still a lot of work to be done because AI is the new data science. And, and the way that people are, it, it's sort of a dark art as to how a lot of these AI algorithms are being built. And um, I, I need help. <laughs> I need help from people that, that can help guide the development of an ethical AI framework uh, you know, to, to make sure that we have diverse teams that know enough about the engineering language of AI to build these protocols in the right way to safeguard against bias. Uh, another one I'll, I'll, I'll say is like, you know, uh, women who are divorced and have the children. They're obviously going to have, there's a, there's a bias against their income levels and how do you control for that properly to make sure that they are not uh, penalized, you know, in, 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 in uh, say lending situations, for example, uh, for, for things like that. Um, so we've got a lot of work to do. I'd say that there's much more work to do than has been done so far. Thank you. Oh, and I'll mention another one there just to add to that and I'll move on, but you may have seen in the news in the last year um, the, the massive and rapid adoption of facial recognition in AI systems and use in law enforcement. They didn't train those AI systems for facial recognition with a diverse uh, set of people. And it's led to a lot of African-American people being misidentified as perpetrators of crimes when they had nothing to do with it because they didn't have enough represent, they didn't have a representative class of people or subjects to, to, to train those AI models. So um, it, it fixated too much on the AI literally became racist. It fixated on skin color as a dominant characteristics instead of all the other nuances of a, a facial, rec facial recognition technology. So there, there's, a, there's a lot of mistakes being made right now, but therein lies the opportunity for us to make it better. Thank you so much. And Lee, you're next. Hi, James. Um, thank you for sharing your story with us. Um, I'm curious if you could uh, share a little bit more about you know, how you uh, deal with negative emotions when you were you know, younger, uh, either you know, negative emotions from uh, historical injustice or you know, inequality and injustice that you may uh, you know, still face or, or you had to face when you were younger as a minority. Uh, sometimes no to it, not always in the right way, <laughs> you know, but I found out, you know, avenues, uh, like, uh, you know, like, uh, growing up, there's was an extraordinarily racist town that I grew up in, you know, uh, there was a, a time when my father and I were walking down the main street of our town and these, uh, uh, you know, um, I'll call them Hicks, the rednecks in, in a pickup truck drove on the sidewalk to try and hit him and me because, and then they swerved away at the last moment laughing, you know, they, they basically, they were playing a game, let's scare the Indian. Um, another time I went into a restaurant and, you know, uh, as we're sitting down and we didn't have a lot of money, but once or twice a month, we'd go out to a restaurant in town. And, uh, as we're sitting down for our special night, you know, a bunch of white people started doing this, like the Indian, uh, oh, and pointing at my dad, you know, and making fun of him. And, and, and I went over right to them and I said, I, I was probably, I think this was right when I was coming, I was probably 16 or 17 and went over to them and I said, I'm, I'm going to interrupt. I, I didn't apologize. I said, I'm going to interrupt your dinner. I saw what you did and I don't like it. You know, and I told, kind of told them off and, and so on. It made me feel better. It shocked, shocked the heck out of them. But, you know, I, I think as, I, as I've grown, I've really tried to um, find ways to not react in an emotionally, you know, not non-constructive manner as much as I have been trying to you know, uh, you know, find a way to connect with people that just are probably doing it out of ignorance or just lack of context and telling them, hey, look, you know, this is uh, um, what you said or what you did. May, it may not, it may or may not have been intentional, but it impacted me in this way. And I find that if I try to connect with people through the heart and, and, and through reason, it tends to get the desired result a lot faster than just kind of 
you know, coming out and coming at them. And because what I learned uh, earlier on is when I come at them, it raises their defenses. And then I, then I lose the opportunity to, 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 um, you know, reach, reach for a better understanding. Yeah, it doesn't always work, but, in, but I leave feeling better. <laughs> yeah. And that's a very, also a very wise way to, to look at, uh, you know, to look at it and how to deal with that emotion. For sure. Thank you. So much. And James, I know we're running close to the uh, to time, but are you willing to entertain these last two questions as well? Sure. Thank you so much. Um, Willie, you're up next. Thank you. Thank you, Justin. Hey, James. Um, first of all, I just want to thank you for being so candid and honest with the interview, and it's been really inspirational for myself uh, to hear someone like your in your position to speak that way uh, to us. So. Really appreciate that. Um, but before I, I ask my question, I'd just like to share a little bit of my background. Uh, grew up in Malaysia. And so a lot of this EDI thing is very new to me. Uh, and, and it's just kind of nice to hear that people are talking it out that way. And also spent both of my career in um, uh, uh, New Brunswick, New Jersey as a minority Asian. So I kind of built up this reputation that you know, we, don't, we don't really talk about these kind of stuff. So um, my, my question for you is that um, how, as a you know, person in my position, if I wanted to be more involved in, in the workplace in the future, a place such as IBM, um, how can I make myself more aware of these things and, you know, just, just be a voice for people who are actually not, you know, currently in, in this position and, and wanted to be more involved? Uh, to be more involved in which way? Uh, maybe I missed uh, so, the middle of your question. Yeah, so, so be involved in more, more of an advocate for EDI and, you know, inclusiveness oh. and, and just everything that we talk about here. Thank you. I, I'd say you're just by being on this call, you're doing that, you know, you're, you're getting started. Um, you know, I, I uh, you know, uh, I, I think as you're looking to move out in the corporate world and, or wherever you may go, you know, I, I, I think being, you know, it, how you might, you know, how, how you might behave during the interview itself would be a, a calling card to say like, you know, like I bring like a team ethos to this. And this is what I mean by that. I let a, student project team in business school where we had eight people from you know four different countries and or, or whatever it might be and just and we and we won the the technical challenge for x y and z or something like that you know it's it's just by virtue of showing your success and framing it in the context of the maybe the teams that you're part of or the teams you lead and 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 explaining how diversity or equity was a uh, was one of the differentiators of, of success um there's a mckinsey study out there um that came out i think a couple of years ago that describes how uh, you know uh, equity, diversity, and, and inclusion is going to be the corporate differentiator for the next 10 years. Um, it, it, if you Google, I'm sure you can find it. Um, but there's a lot of facts in there and a lot of uh, statements around uh, what you're describing as how to present and how to frame yourself up for success and those kinds of things. It's not where you come in and raise your wave your 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 race card around. It's it's like this is the work I do. Companies want to know what you can do. How can you help them? improve revenue? How can you help them improve productivity? How can you help them get closer to their customer base and micro segmentation? I mean, the experience and where you come from is, is part of that solution. Um, you know, and, and I'm glad to see you're from, uh, from Malaysia. I, it's just a little brief aside. I was in Singapore for a summer. And as you know, those of you who don't know Singapore, it's a kind of an amalgam of a lot of different folks from the Asia uh, region, Pacific region uh, working there. And um, I was making good headway with the native Singapore Singaporean team, and they were an international team, and I and and I was having more success than the other IBMers from the U.S. at, at getting their buy-in. And finally, at lunch, about four weeks into it, they they pulled me aside as a little group, and they said, "We've been talking about you for the last month. It's like we we know you're some kind of Asian, but we can't figure out what kind of Asian you are because everyone there was some kind of Asian." And I had to explain I was American Indian, and they said, "Oh, okay. Well, you're close enough to us." And so. Just, I guess, in that case, my how I look and my ethnicity was actually a benefit for that project because they were themselves a collection of uh, cultures and people from all over Asia, and it helped us connect and, and find commonality together for that. And that was actually the semiconductor project. But um, um, you know, there's, you, you never know when 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 re, your background is going to be, you know, an enabler of success in ways that you can't even imagine. And that was a good one. Thank you, thank you, James. Appreciate that. And to finally close things off, Yanan, please feel free to ask your question. Thank you. And thank you so much, Jim, for being here with us. Um, 
My question is, I guess a little bit of background story is I feel that Alec and Anders have helped me a lot in terms of like, you know, getting me into the community. I was really scared of business schools before then I feel so much better. Um, but also I feel there's a lot of things we can do. So same question for you is with your, you know, looking forward and looking at what we have right now in the business world for EDI, what are something we can work on or something most crucial thing in the next five or 10 years in terms of EDI we can develop? Thank you so much. Uh, may I use your background as, a, as an example? I see your pronouns are they, them. <laughs> yes. Um, and my oldest nephew, by the way, is non-binary um, in, in, by virtue. And, and I, I'd say like a big opportunity just in terms of what you bring just from this, my only, almost no knowledge of your background is that companies are really, are, are really looking for expertise and personal perspective on how to integrate you know, away from the traditional, you know, male, female gender uh, assignments, because uh, they're, they're, they're all realizing that they got to get much smarter about how they relate to their customers. Let's say it's a retail organization and they're building up a customer database. And, you know, we've got all these gender classifications now, which is an awesome way to reflect the diversity of who we are as a human, you know, population. But, you know, even I myself as a, a gay man, I'm not going to have the same perspective as you would bring to that team. You know, in terms of how do we frame this? How do we develop the marketing messages? How do we build the right data science protocols to reflect maybe um, some buying behavior or needs and, 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 and desires that this community would want? And I think what you bring to that is incredibly powerful from a business perspective because it hasn't, at least as far as I, I've seen so far, it hasn't been as, as, as much experience in the corporate world as, say, even the gay rights movement, which has been a few decades now. So there's more institutional you know, uh, about that. But this is a new opportunity for all of us to figure this out and make sure that we're talking to people of different uh, uh, gender identifications properly and making them feel respected and, uh, you know, included in our mission. Not sure, not sure if you tailor an answer to me, but thank you so much. Love to hear that. Oh, what part did I miss? What part did I miss? I'm sorry. No, no, I'm like, you tailor, you know, use me as an example. It's also really nice to hear. Okay. Thank you so much for everybody's questions tonight. Um, before I hand things over to Kevin to close things out, we would really love it if people would turn on their cameras and just like give us a little bit of a smile because we'd love to take a nice Zoom screenshot and post it on our Instagram page.